Saber Wolf. Hello everybody, it's uh, Saber Wolf, and yeah, I still got the open there for you guys. Uh, this video, I'm going to be going over some D&D uh, &D stuff. This is called a talent tree. It's a little bit of a homebrew, but it's something that we're going to be using on our Friday night dice. And again, you can catch that every Friday night on my Saber Wolf Gaming 2Ms over on my Twitch stream. And of course, the VODs will be available after the fact uh, on Monday. So without further ado, let's get into some of the talent trees. Now, basically what the talent tree is, again, it's just like the um, kind of feats that you would find um in the actual regular D, D, but this has been broken down to smaller parts and it can be given as a progressive thing to replace the feats or as a reward that you can have as a dm to your players now let's, let's uh, switch over to that screen for you guys now i uh, have it is up to as big as possible on your screen so if you maximize your screen to full size you should be able to read it with no problem uh or you can try to shrink down the screen and just maximize that one spot um, but anyways, what talent trees are, again, it's uh, you gain access to these various talent trees. You see these in uh, video games like that. Um, and basically what you have here is you have a base ability. It's like a little tiny ability that you might have. And you can progress in like three different paths or two or three or four. So I'm actually at four. And then you have your capstone, which is a strong ability, which is like a higher end feat that you can get to. Um, some of these are weaker, some of these are more powerful than the actual features that you have in the actual D&D &D part. But overall, this is really cool and progressive, and it kind of makes your character feel like it's going to grow even more, and gives little bitty incentives that you can get for your uh, characters you move along. Uh, of course, you have all the skill proficiencies like acrobatics, athletics, deception, performance, religion, etc., etc. Or you can also have other specialty ones, which is adventuring, armor, apprenticeship, uh, martial talent, war magic, and weapon specialization. Um, and those actually have slightly difference where you can use like minor, those are main, minor or major or supreme or something like that. Uh, so those are slightly different than the points that you would get to actually get into these uh, abilities. Uh, so I can go with those later. But uh, let's just go to the first one, which is like acrobatics. Uh, so basically, you have your handspring expert, which would be the first point of the ability. And so this is uh, when you are prone, standing up only uses only 10 feet of your movement. Now, when you're prone and you try to stand up, you're supposed to use half your movement. The average character on the movement speed is like 30 feet. So half that movement would be 15 feet. Or you can have a character that usually just moves 40 feet. And that could be 20 feet, So which would even be more detrimental. Even though they're faster, they actually cost more of their movement speed. This ability lets you to cut that even smaller if it only uses 10 feet of movement. So the same character that has 40 feet of movement, instead of moving 20 more feet, they can actually move 30 feet, which is a full movement speed of your normal character. So that can be pretty helpful when you have like these kind of acrobatic things, or if you have like a, a rogue, or some sort of thief, or maybe even a mobile fighter, uh, and meaning you got knocked down prone, you can get right back up and you can try to move that back an actual full 30 feet as well as moving only like 20 or 15. Um, then you also have other, then you can progress through, say, the left side. So the left side would be, next one would be free stride. Uh, your quick stride lets you carefully pick a path through the terrain. Your speed increases by 10 feet. When you take the dash action, difficult terrain costs you no extra movement this turn. So on top of the increasing your movements to say like a base of 30 to an actual base of 40, you also can take your dash action which, if you're a rogue, that's like a bonus action for you, you, and you're going through difficult terrain, it doesn't cost you any extra movement. So you still get that full 40 feet of movement, only costing you as a bonus action so you can get to where you need to get to. So this is, these are the really cool and different ways that you can create on your character that's actually not really available on the feats that you have from the actual Player's Handbook or Dungeon Master's Guide or whatever expansion that you've gone through. And, of course, yes, Tasha's. Um, <laughs> and if you progress another step further down the line, say withdraw, uh, when you make an attack against a creature, you don't provoke opportunity attacks from that creature for the rest of the turn, whether you hit or miss. This is actually a rogue ability. I believe it's on the swashbuckler. Um, so that gives you, allows you to have like a swashbuckler ability, but you can put it on another character, say a fighter 
Or maybe you have, like, say, like a Warlock that is a uh, Hexblade, and you attack into melee, but Hexblades don't normally have great armor class. So you have this ability with this withdrawal, so you can take don't take an opportunity attack when you try to move away from your target you just hit. <coughs> and then as you progress through, you would get to free running, which is all the way down here at the bottom. And that would be uh, when you take the dash action, if you're wearing light or no armor, uh, you can run on vertical surfaces along the edges of thin barriers or hop on one outcropping to another as you are traveling along normal terrain. If you stop moving while running across the wall, you begin to fall. So this is that kind of wall running ability you have that you see like ninjas or something use like that, or monks that you see in movies. Um, that you kind, of, or you kind of run across the walls like really fast across like a spike pit or something. So this would give you that ability to do that. And this would be the capstone ability, so as you progress from Aspirin Expert to Free Stride Withdraw, you can get to the free running. If you want tumbling agility instead, or slippery or escape artist, uh, you can pick those that path in order to get to the free running. Whatever fits your character most, and like I said, for withdraw, since like if I was using my like say a swashbuckler uh, profession or class, um, that already has the withdraw feature, so I might choose like another path to take because I already get that as a free uh, skill from my class progression already. So you kind of have to look into it. Of course, you have animal handling, um, which is kind of long. You also have arcane, arcana, which you can look into uh, ritual caster. So you can get like a ritual casting ability through this uh, pathing. Um, you also have athletics, which for me was very great, great to, to me. You also have deception, where you can. Um, so like you see, a uh, heart of treachery, which is the capstone. Is you have you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed. And any spells that would determine if you were telling the truth or compel you to do so, these spells do not alert the caster when they fail on you. So when you cast, like, say, Zone of Truth from a Paladin, which is a very popular skill for Paladins, this skill um, capability under Deception would actually defeat that spell from actually working on them. So you can still deceive your way through the cast, through, even though you have Zone of Truth around you. So, yeah, pretty, pretty darn cool, actually, you know, right? Oops. I keep going, forgetting when you hit the arrow. I'm going to jump ahead to uh, Nature. And you see, this is a long book. This is a 22, 20, this is actually a 22 page. I you can't see, you can't see the pages. But this is actually a 22 page uh, homebrew. Once again, uh, shout out to uh, Krios1, uh, sorry. Yeah, Krios125 or 8125. Or 8125, can't figure out which it is. And uh, I am from NASA. They were the creators of this homebrew. And it also shout out to Inti, one of our Friday Night Dice guys, for introducing this uh, to us as well. Uh, so here's the nature one. Uh, nature sent uh, using just a branch, a dowsing rod, magnetic needle, or other instruments. So for, in your knowledge of nature, you can define you can divine the details of your surroundings. By spending 10 minutes examining the signs in the environment around you, you can select one of the following options. Local weather and climate. You predict the weather for the next 24 hours at your location and learn whether it is in the season or drought, famine, feast, or flood. You must be able to see the sky. So I guess you can't use this underground. <laughs> uh, closest water source. You learn location of the closest source of clean, fresh water within a mile of your location. This might be a stream, spring, water collecting plant, or something else. Residents. You discern if the local plant life or animals were tended by a ranger, druid, or a creature such as a dryad within the last week. Um, so that's interesting. Um, it's not really maybe useful in most terms, uh, but that's pretty uh, pretty wide range there. Uh, then you have like three different paths. It looks like you have a monster's path, a uh, plant path, and maybe creatures like natural defiance. Let's see what that does. Uh, you know how to avoid natural ambushers. You gain the following benefits. Uh, you can't be surprised by plants or oozes. So yeah, more plant kind of fungus kind of stuff. And then knowledge of materials. Um, sorry, I'm just been this late. I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of videos tonight. So sorry guys. 
Um, you can spend 10 minutes examining a structure to discern its age and locate possible weak points based on mineralogic clues. When you deal damage to an object you have examined in this way, you can you deal the maximum amount of damage instead of rolling. So, for let's say if Ryan wanted to do this, if he hit a door after uh, examining it, he would automatically hit it for the maximum amount of damage that he could do and doesn't even have to roll for it, which is kind of interesting, actually. And you have the cap skill, which is a nature craft. Uh, you can use the tools of an herbalist for a variety of purposes by using five gold points worth of common herbalist supplies and spending at least eight hours, so basically a long rest almost, acquiring, preparing, and packing them into a kit. You can create an herbalist kit from scratch. In addition, the two other benefits of the herbalist kit provides you, you can spend 10 minutes to produce one of the following effects. You can purify a portion of food or drink, rendering it free of poison and disease. You can increase the potency of a healing potion for one hour. When you do so, the potion restores the maximum number of hit points with instead of rolling. Wow. Last but not least, you can create up to one vial worth of acid, sealing wax, or perfume. So more of like an RP kind of thing in the last one. So that's really interesting. Um, I don't know if that would really fit with Ryan uh, per se, but yeah. Um, but this uh, document continues. Um, again, if you want to look for it, it's called Talent Tree underscore V1. Uh, if you want to take a look at it. And again, we have all the comp we have the stealth, survival, sleight of hand, and stuff like that. Uh, then you have the extra uh, specialty trees. I'm not even going to go to the uh, lucky and stuff like that. Uh, we don't believe in the luck point stuff. I mean, that's just kind of broken. Um, you have one luck point, you get two luck points. Uh, but the very end that you can do is, like, every time you use a luck point, the DM also gets their own luck point uh, to use on a future roll against you. So, in other words, a DM could re-roll a die. If they roll a natural one, they could just re-roll it. <laughs> Because you used a luck point. Um, so that's really a rough one, yeah. But this one right here. Uh, this one, I was really looking to do uh, this uh, endurance into resilient. Because resilient was one of the features I wanted to get for Ryan. Um, and it's like you choose one ability to score, you gain proficiency and saving throws with the chosen ability. Uh, the reason why I think about that because I want to get resilient into constitution which adds my proficiency modifier into that uh, ability, which increases it would by then it'll increase it by I believe plus four uh, or plus three or four. And um, which gives the ability to when I roll my warcaster to maintain concentration on that cap spell that I want to get, which is haste, he can cast himself, and when he gets hit in combat, he needs to maintain it. So that will give me an additional plus four to the already advantage roll that I would have in order to try to maintain that ability. And a plus four or one D on a one D twenty is kinda big. Uh, you gotta think that's like a one fifth of a roll. So that's pretty decent. Um, unfortunately I'd have to get endurance before I can get the resilient where going down the feature path I could just go straight to resilient. So that's an example of how the talent tree is kind of slower than it would be on a straight feature, ASI, as you might call it, which is level 4, 8, etc. Um, so that shows that this could be a little bit slower, where you have to take like a different feat, which endurance is a different kind of different feat, in order to get into a different feat that you really want, which is resilient. Um, but it's not all bad. Like endurance would be um, when you roll a hit die to regain hit points, the minimum number of hit points you gain, regain from the roll equals to twice your constitution modifier. So a constitution modifier for Ryan would be plus three. So in other words, the lowest he could roll to regain hit points would be uh, plus three, would be three plus three um, because of the constitu you had to constitution score to gain hit points. So the minimum you can gain on a, on a short rest on a roll on a roll would be six hit points minimum, as opposed to getting only Four, so you would actually get an extra two hit points, I guess. 
And you can get it every time you roll. So it's decent. A short rest to make sure you gain an extra like two, four, six extra HP. Um, if you low rolled everything. So yeah, it's that bad. All right, get to resilient. Um, the resistant at the end is choose one of the following damage types, which is acid, cold, fire, lightning, poison, or thunder. And you get a resistance to that ch damage of the chosen type. Getting uh, resistance to just a random uh, like spell source, like fire, for instance, being just having just straight up resistance to like fireball. And if you make your dexterity save on it, you will only take a quarter of the damage, as opposed to half the damage, or half you only take half damage. Even if you miss the roll, you still only take half damage. Um, so that's kind of interesting uh, to have that. But the resilient is the part I want. I don't really want any other part of it. I don't want the endurance resistant. Meh. Um, so yeah, I would. I am probably just gonna go for the feet when I get to level eight paladin, um, and go from there. Um, and then you have other ones. You have the armor training, which has like four different paths because you have light, shield, medium, and heavy. Uh, this is actually the one I'm thinking about taking because on the armor one. Because I have the armor training already for heavy armor, so the armor training base one is you gain the proficiency of the armor type, so light, medium, or heavy. So say if you're like a wizard and you only have access to maybe light armor, you can actually gain this proficiency into getting a padded plate, or in actually armor training, sorry, in order to use the medium armor for your wizard. Uh, but this is kind of the path I think I'm going to take for Ron because he already has the armor training for the heavy armor. I can skip that line because um, some of some of these, if you already have the proficiency for it, you can skip it and go to the next one. But it depends on which uh, ones you do. If you do these uh, these ones like persuasion like that, I don't think it lets you skip it on this uh, homebrew. Uh, but for the armor, it does. So that's why I'm thinking about Ryan to get built to stand. Which means that whenever I'm wearing heavy armor, which I, he's wearing full plate, uh, you have advantage on contested checks and saving throws against the effects that would knock you prone or push you. Since we have a TM right now in Leo that likes to push, pull, grab, and like that, uh, our characters, um, this kind of feat would actually be kind of beneficial to counter what he's trying to do to my character. Um, also, in addition, your speed is not reduced by wearing armor or strength required. Okay. I have the strength, obviously, because he has like 20 strength or 18 strength. Um, so that part wouldn't matter. Um, that would matter if you had like a low strength character. Uh, you could gain the proficiency in heavy armor, and you could take this, where it would negate the strength requirement in order to use the heavy armor. So you could still use the heavy armor, even if you're a little tiny person. Um, but having the uh, advantage on being knocked prone or being pushed. Could be beneficial being on the front line and getting knocked prone and prevent me from doing that. And you also get the Heavy Armor Master after that, which um, which uh, lowers the uh, damage from bludgeon, piercing, and slashing damage that I would take from non-magical sources. That's something that um, boss monsters actually have. Uh, so, and it actually gets reduced by my proficiency bonus. So it's not a true like full resistance, where it's like half damage. It's only like a small chip into that damage, like only like uh, minus three or minus four. Um, but still, like any if something deals like ten damage to me, I'm actually knocking it down to say around six damage. So it does save a little bit of HP, four HP, you know, per hit, you know, like that. Um, <clears throat> and then you get the maximum, then you get the master of protection. Uh, you ignore half the weight on your arm you're wearing for being being cumbered. Uh, when you're subject to an effect that would corrode or rust. Uh, your armor, <clears throat> you can use reaction to prevent it from even happening. So maybe like a black ooze or green ooze or something like that, I believe, that kind of could do that. Um, also, when a creature scores a critical hit against you while wearing medium or heavy armor, uh, you can use your reaction to cause it to become a normal hit. So, yeah, Master of Protection negating a critical hit against yourself. That is definitely big. Um, so gaining a slight reduction to damage against you from non-magical weapons and then negating a critical hit 
after you already have a advantage roll on saving throws against you for being knocked down and pushed. So that's why I'm thinking about taking that uh, talent tree because it's just a little extra talent tree that could take on the side that just kind of builds itself up on its own. I don't have to worry about taking feats or anything like that. That actually has abilities that are not available to you from feats and like that. So that's why I think I'm going to take this path for Ryan, uh, for out campaign and like that. So in the end, and they also have apprenticeships of weapon, um, um, martial talent, which is weapon, um, information like that. And last but not least, we're going to go into some, um, uh, weapons. Uh, there's like a uh, mix between a major, uh, major intermediate and a minor specialties. Uh, you for you get multiple points uh, for the specialization, and for when you spend one point, you can get one major specialty, two intermediate specialties, one intermediate, one minor. If you like kind of minor, because some of the minors are actually better than the intermediate ones, or you can gain three minor specialties. So if you're going through this, you gain three minor specialties in your range character. You can get close quarter shooter, precise shooter, and sharpshooter. Or you can get a hammer fanner, which means ignoring the loading property of ranged weapons. So say if you want to use a crossbow and you have multiple attacks on, say, a ranger, you can take hammer fanner, which ignores the loading property of weapons, and you can get precise shooter, which mean, or even a sharpshooter means attacking one range doesn't impose a disadvantage on your attack rules. So now you can shoot things, which is, I think, what I had. I think this is what I had on uh, Therese. So I can ignore the reload property, so I can use whatever crossbow I wanted and still get two attacks out of it, and I can still hit from 240 to 300 feet away without imposing a disadvantage. So you can also use that from instead of getting the feats from a sniper or a sharpshooter like that from those feats, and you can get them this way by using a point system on the talent tree. So like I said, uh, credits to, and this is our credits on here, but the credits uh, for trying to create this was uh, Krios. It is Krios125. Uh, and from I Am NASA. This is their homebrew. Once again, uh, introduced by uh, Inti. And I hope you guys uh, liked it. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Rate, comment, subscribe. Uh, if you want more content and interesting uh, homebrews like that. There is one homebrew that I was making for myself. It's actual race that used to be in the old D&D stuff. I'm trying to bring it into uh, 5e, and I'll probably share it with you guys in a week or two from now. Uh, but yeah, let me know. Uh, so without further ado, I am Saber Wolf. I think. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. I am Saber Wolf. Thank you, and have a good day.